Did you know that Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson used to be best buds? Before a betrayal befitting Brutus and Caesar tore them apart. Yes, I am of course talking about the treacherous move of Michael Jackson purchasing the publishing rights to the Beatles' back catalogue right from under Paul McCartney's nose. So let's find out how this friendship began, how the betrayal unfolded, and if Paul ever got those rights back to his own songs. Hi, I'm Adam, welcome back to Music Mongoose. Two powerhouses from the world of music, Paul McCartney with his background in the Beatles, changing the face of music forever, and Michael Jackson establishing himself as a solo artist in his own right, eventually becoming the king of pop. It makes sense that they'd eventually cross paths. The pair first met briefly in 1974 and then met again a few years later at a Beverly Hills party celebrating the end of the North American leg of the Wings Over the World tour. Between the first and the second time of the pair meeting, Paul, knowing that Michael was a prolific fan of his and the Beatles, decided to cook up a little surprise. At the party, Paul told Michael he'd written a song specifically for him called My Girlfriend. Due to a bunch of different reasons though, the offer eventually fell through and it actually ended up being recorded by Wings and included in their album, London Town. The year after, Jackson's longtime producer, Quincy Jones, came to Michael with an idea. You see, Quincy Jones had heard the song on the Wings album and had absolutely no idea it was originally intended for Michael. He thought Michael would do a killer cover of it. Yeah, funny that. Jackson did record a cover version which was subsequently included on his breakthrough record, Off the Wall, in 1979. Later, Jackson, perhaps regretful of not accepting Paul's initial offer for My Girlfriend, decided to give him a little phone call. He rang me up one Christmas day, I think it was, and I heard this, uh, hello? <laughs> He's very weird. Oh? Yeah. I said, hello, is this? I thought, uh-oh, wait a minute, this American fan's got my uh, uh, home phone number. Right. Thought, this is weird. I said, hello, yes. Yeah, no, he's not, he's not here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he said, oh, hi, Paul. So, anyway, he came over. He, I said, what do you want to do? He said, make some hits. I said, well, that sounds good. So we, we Soon, him and McCartney had brewed a lovely little bromance. Yeah. So he came over here to England, and we just hung out for a little while and got to know each other a bit and um, ended up writing two songs. Those songs would be Say, Say, Say and The Man. It was quite a short session, so it was very nice. We had a really good time. We made a couple of records together, did a video, and um, we're very good friends. Two years would pass before both the songs were eventually released on Paul's fifth solo album, Pipes of Peace. After recording those songs, the pair moved on to The Girl Is Mine, which served as the first single for Jackson's and the world's most successful album of all time, Thriller. The track was written by Michael. Legend has it the whole song just came to him in the middle of the night. He woke up and recorded the whole thing with his voice on a voice recorder to later show Quincy Jones. From there, the track was arranged and McCartney was enlisted for his vocal duties. Jackson always regarded the recording process of this song as one of the most enjoyable of his entire career. He had this to say about it. Working with Paul McCartney was pretty exciting and we just literally had fun. It was like lots of kibitzing and playing and throwing stuff at each other and making jokes. The track was recorded at Westlake Studios in LA, the base where the album Thriller would be created. The Girl Is Mine was released as a single before the album was even completed. Now, one interesting fact that I did learn during the research for this video is that Michael Jackson recorded a lot of his vocals for the Thriller album in the dark. Bruce Swedeen was an engineer on the album and had this to say. I think one reason why he wanted this and why it works so effectively is the human being is primarily a visual animal. Hearing is our second sense. People can be distracted by too much light in the studio to the extent that it can take away from the music. That or he was a vampire. The single got to number two in the Billboard 100 charts, number eight in the UK charts, and would eventually become certified platinum, shifting a million copies. Later, of course, the album was completed and, well, you know how successful that was. So where does the betrayal come into all of this? Well, let's rewind back to those initial sessions in the early 80s where Michael and Paul were recording Say 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 and The Man. Michael, on his new path as a solo musician, decided to ask Paul for some friendly advice. Michael said, have you got any advice? You know, so I said, yeah, look, this is what you got to do. You're really hot. It's just starting. It just had off the wall. And I said, you've got to make some great videos. 
So he went off and made Thriller and things yeah. like that. And I said, and you ought to think of getting into song publishing. Little did Paul know that advice would come back to bite him on his big old beetle bottom. And he looked at me, kind of, I thought he was joking, he said, I'm going to get yours. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I kind of thought, oh, you. <laughs> In August 1985, Jackson plunged the proverbial dagger into McCartney's back and purchased the publishing rights to the majority of the Beatles' back catalogue from ATV. Now, the reason this was such a monumental betrayal is because Paul McCartney was, quite rightfully, keen to obtain those rights for himself. In fact, Paul McCartney wasn't receiving any share of any Beatles song since 1969, all because him and John Lennon were young and naive when they first signed a publishing contract. John and I didn't know about song publishing. We literally thought that songs were, were in the air and that everyone owned them. That's, that's literally how we met our first publisher. Hi there. He said, come in. <laughs> Is that what you think? Sit over here. And that was the deal they did. Now, despite all this, Paul McCartney did have a chance to obtain the rights before they landed in Michael Jackson's lap. The rights had changed hands a good few times before Michael eventually scooped them up. At one point, they were offered to Paul for $20 million. He would phone up Yoko Ono, who would agree to go halves and finally return the catalogue to its rightful home. However, the catalogue ended up selling for... <coughs> 50 million US dollars. That would be around 142.6 million dollars in today's money. How did Michael afford to bid that high? Straight off the back of Thriller, he was like, cash rich, baby. So the album that Paul McCartney helped create in a small way ended up becoming the means for Michael Jackson to snap up that back catalog. Oh, the irony. Paul did of course try to convince Michael to hand over the rights, but the King of Pop responded with something along the lines of, that's just business, Paul. But maybe Michael Jackson would be responsible and use the publishing rights for good. No. Throughout the height of the Beatles, they received countless lucrative offers from the world's biggest brands to include their tracks in TV commercials. The Beatles always refused, wanting to not dilute the integrity of their art. Michael didn't really care about that. Soon, Beatles songs were appearing on Nike adverts all over TV. The publishing rights would continue to fund Jackson's insane lifestyle until he passed away in 2009. <laughs> Do you ever think Paul saw photos and videos of his Neverland ranch on TV and thought, that's my money that bought that house, you... In 2017, McCartney filed a lawsuit against Sony slash ATV in an attempt to finally return his rights to him. After lots of boring, drawn-out legal stuff, a settlement was reached and Paul finally got what he wanted the back catalogue of his own blasted songs. So there you go. That was the time that Michael Jackson effectively owned the Beatles. Do you think it was wrong of Michael to do that? Or was it just clever business thinking? Let me know in the comments below. And did you know that Paul Townsend from The Who was very nearly the man to perform the guitar solo on the song Beat It instead of Eddie Van Halen? You can click here to watch the video and the full story on that. Subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with my weekly videos and I'll catch you next time on Music Mongoose. <laughs> okay, bye!